Now, because this is a conference, last night I started off on a preaching note. Today I want to devote the day to teach and for us to engage in some practical things so that we can understand our mission. Amen? Yesterday we defined mission. We understood what mission is. This morning I want to start off with why plant a church. Now yesterday we studied about the fact that we need to go out and preach the gospel. So this morning and throughout the day, I'll be doing quite a lot of teaching and I want us to come along as we listen. It's very important. Jesus, we understand mission means sending out. To send out. And we realize that it has been the heartbeat of God throughout the ages. We saw from yesterday, throughout, from Genesis, right through, God has been calling and sending, calling, sending. And when Jesus came, he said that just as the Father has sent me, so I sent you. So the Father sent him. So Christ also came on mission. Yesterday I explained that David Livingston said a very, made a very profound statement. He was one of the great missionaries to Africa. And even as he died in Africa on mission, his heart is still buried in Africa. The body has been brought back to the United Kingdom, but his heart is still buried there. And he said, God has only one son. And he was a missionary. God has only one son. And he was a missionary. And I pray that we will desire to go out and preach the gospel. But the process of making people disciples. Remember that our main function and main assignment is in Matthew 28 that tells us that go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And so our assignment is to make disciples. But you realize that after we've gone to preach, we must have a base. We must have a platform by which we make disciples and that is called a church. Somebody shout church. church. I will show you this morning that one of the effective ways of evangelizing is planting churches. So missions must factor serious church planting into the whole thing. We also must understand that it is our mission as a church. For the next 10 years that we are Making disciples and planting churches. So planting churches is a very important aspect of our mission. Starting off from the understanding that everybody will get access to yesterday's message. Let me just shoot off straight away. Why plant churches? I want you to spend the next one minute, talk to somebody and ask the person, what do you think is the reason why we must plant churches? And get some response from them. Okay, Abigail is up first, so Sister Kemi, you speak after Abigail. Okay, Abigail, we want to hear you. Um, it's part of the Great Commission to go out and make disciples, and it's important that they are planted in a church where um, their spiritual father can lead them. I, I couldn't hear what you're saying. <laughs> I said it's part of the Great Commission to mm -hmm. go out and make disciples, mm -hmm. and it's important that we are led by our spiritual father. Okay, so that is the reason why we must plant a church. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Sister Kemi. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there was something my um, sister here said. She says we can't have homeless Christians, which is brilliant. Um, so we must plant churches so that when we go out and we evangelize, there is a place for people to grow. Um, you, you can't just tell them, oh, Jesus Christ is this and expect them to start to grow. It's like being born again. Um, when you're born, you're born into a family. So um, it is important that you have a home where you can grow. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. All right, so let's just, just move off quickly this morning. The first thing that I want us to realize is that there are some principles that apply to church planting. Uh, actually, I should have taught you that one first, um, but let me go off here and then I'll come back to teach those principles. There are about 12 principles that are important to church planting. The first one is called the mission principle. I believe that every pastor and every deacon in this room and anyone who has gone through our school of ministry development would have come across these 12 principles of church leadership. 
Like they are the same things that apply also in church planting. So the mission principle says that the central work of the new church will be to help people put their trust in Christ and grow into maturity as followers of Christ. Amen. The second principle is what is called the multiplication principle. That is principle number 11. There are 12 principles of church planting. I'm picking some of the principles here. Later on, I'll teach you the whole 12. But for now, principle number six is the first principle when it comes to the reasons why we must plant a church or why plant a church. The central work of the new church will always be to help people put their trust in Christ and grow into maturity as followers of Christ. And then the multiplication principle is also the principle that, is, that undergirds the reason why we must plant churches. That healthy churches will reproduce and daughter church planting should be envisioned and planned from the new church's beginning. What this principle says is that every time we have a church that has been planted, right from day one, we must start envisioning the birth of another daughter church. And that every church must reproduce to give birth to other churches and produce more churches. So right from the beginning of any church plant, it should be there at the back of our mind. We are not just going to be only us here. We must grow and immediately start thinking of spreading and planting churches, daughter churches. Now, church planting is critically important because it honors God. Let's move to the next slide quickly. Church planting is critically important because it honors God and spreads his name, his love, and message of salvation among the nations. The message of salvation among the nations. Can you all see the screen? So church planting is critically important because it honors God and spreads his name, his love, and his message of salvation among the nations. Romans 15 verse 9 says that so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. Gentiles translated nations. For through him and for his name's sake, we receive grace and apostleship to call from among all the people obedience that comes from faith. Romans 1, 5. Now, five reasons to plant churches. Five reasons to plant churches. All right, let's go. So the five reasons to plant a church, number one, is to follow the biblical strategy. The biblical strategy is exactly what Jesus did. That's what is there in the scriptures. If we look through the scriptures, we see that the early church planted churches. They planted churches. And so it is a biblical strategy. You realize that the church in Jerusalem ended up planting, sending people to plant. Out of the church in Jerusalem, there was a church in Antioch. And then the church in Ephesus. And then the church in Philippi. And it continues. So there is always the biblical strategy of planting churches. So when the Lord says we should go out and preach the gospel, he didn't only say we should just preach people, but actually we must be able to teach people. They grow in the house of God. And then out of that group, we send people to plant churches. It is a necessity to follow the biblical strategy. The second reason is to evangelize effectively. To evangelize effectively. All right. So to evangelize effectively, you see, it's very important for us to see that one of the effective ways of evangelism is church planting. For everybody to hear the gospel, to have a wider group of people 
being rich for the gospel, we must plant more churches. You see, there is a certain number of people who will come to, let's say, the church here because they don't live too far away from here. But there's a certain group of people that we may reach, they may love our ministry, but they will be living too far away from here that we will not be able to actually get them to disciple them effectively. But if we take the church towards where they are, we will be able to reach them. So, for example, every Sunday, we may not be able to have somebody living in Aylesbury come to church here consistently. There are some people, they've got that commitment, they can do so. But I believe that people living in Aylesbury will feel more able to be reached when we have a church at their doorstep. Now, and then what happens, therefore, is that based on the biblical strategy or the effective evangelism, remember, evangelism is taking the gospel to people. And one of the ways to do it effectively is if we plant micro churches as far as possible, wherever people are, we will be able to reach them more than when we are just located in one place. So the people in Ephesus could not hear the gospel until a church was planted there because they all can be traveling regularly to Jerusalem. There are too many reasons to give an excuse of not being able to make it. But when the church is at the doorstep of people, we are reaching more people by planting more churches. And in the end, you will see that if we, for example, plant 10 churches or 100 churches, which is made up of just 10 members each, we will have a 1,000 member church. That means we have reached 1,000 people with the gospel than just sitting down here and waiting for us to be thousand in this room. Are you here? So it's very important that by the biblical strategy for effective evangelization, we must actually be conscious of planting churches everywhere, everywhere. In the end, when we all gather, you will see the total number of people that we have reached. Number three, to gather in the harvest. Amen. To gather in the harvest. Because in the end, every soul, Jesus referred to them as the harvest. The crops that have been planted. That's why the word of God is described as the seed. So when we sow the seed of the word of God, we must reap the harvest of the people that have responded. And in order for us to gather in much harvest, we must have churches wherever we can find. So church planting is effective evangelism. And I pray that because it is our mission to plant churches, we must start thinking about church planting and have practical means and strategies of planting churches. It's very, very key. Somewhere this afternoon when we move into a q and I'll be able to answer some practical strategies that we can adopt in doing some of these things. But to gather in the harvest is one of the reasons why we need to plant churches. The fourth reason is to reach people groups. People groups. Now, in missiology, if you study theology, one of the disciplines that we study is missiology, the study of missions. And in missiology, you are taught people groups. So we've got different groups of people. We've got blacks and whites. Then we've got Africans and we've got Caucasians and got Japanese and Chinese, etc. If we are going to reach certain groups of people, we must plant churches. See, the gospel came to Africa through many of the missionaries. They breached boundaries, rest the day, definition of missions. They crossed boundaries to reach a people group that is totally different from them, who carry a different language. If we want to reach more Spanish people, yes, we may have a Spanish service, but it's better that we get to Spain and plant a church there too. And that's why the European left the comfort of their homes and came all the way to Africa to plant a church. And they planted churches. They paid the price. Yesterday we understood we must pay some price. We don't want to have Jonas and Jonah was. We want to have committed people. 
serving the Lord. No excuses. But that is the way the gospel got to some of us. Some people paid the price. In my book on doing the master's will, I shared about the experience in Kenya where I saw many missionaries, some of them third generation, fourth generation missionaries. And they are still there. Some of them come from Canada, beautiful Canada, compared to Matari North. Where are the Kenyans in the house? There's a place called Matari North. It's a slum. There are some places in the villages, some of the villages that they, they were. I was staying in David Livingston's house where he, he was living before. And some of them had to come only to retreat and go back. Back to the villages. Some from North Carolina. It's, these are beautiful places. I've been to North Carolina. I know how the place looks like. People are from Canada and they are staying in these places just for the sake of the gospel. So you can imagine 200 years ago, they paid the price because salvation is so crucial. And we cannot just be sitting in a comfort zone hearing the word after word, anointing service upon anointing service. We have the, like I said yesterday, Jonah's problem was not that his theology was wrong. He knew the word. Remember, he quoted scriptures. He said so many things which can be found exactly word for word in Exodus, which God himself described himself to be. Josh, Jonah had the mind of God, but didn't have the heart of God for lost souls. So to reach different people groups, we must plant churches. Hallelujah. We must plant churches. I'm excited when I get to Switzerland and I preach and they have to translate in German. We are reaching different people groups. And it's important that when we plant churches, it widens the net and creates opportunity for others to hear the gospel. And finally, to fulfill the great commission. Reasons why we must plant churches. To fulfill the great commission. Because at the end of the day, we have a marching order or marching orders from our savior and commander in chief, Jesus the Christ. And he says, go. It wasn't you may go. It says, go. Make disciples. So the whole thing is about doing. It's about doing. What are you doing at this moment? What are you doing for the Lord? Because the assignment is to do. Go and make disciples of all nations. So this is the base, but this must not end the church. The church must spread. We must be kingdom minded. We must be church planting conscious because church planting is effective evangelism. And ultimately, it is to fulfill the great commission. The great commission is located in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Go, make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name. It didn't say you may. It's an order. Baptize them. How many churches are we planting and how many people are we baptizing every day and every week and every month in our churches? This should be the assessment criteria that we should be looking at whether we are actually fulfilling the great commission given to us by the Lord. He has done his part for us. It's our duty to do our part for him. And like I explained yesterday, we have no excuse whatsoever. Naturally, we all love our comfort zones. We like to be comfortable where we are. But God's son, who he made a missionary, left the comfort of heaven and came on missions on this earth for 33 and a half years. How long have you been where you are? That mission he came, that saved you and I, was not a comfortable one. He didn't wait till computers arrived. He is God. He knows that in the 21st century there will be computers. There will be wonderful carpeted rooms. The early church didn't have any of this. <laughs> there will be microphones and megaphones. He preached raw by the seaside. Jesus could have waited for all this ahead and then he comes in the 21st century. Nice ministry and lives somewhere 
in New York. There are some crazy parts of New York. When you get there, you think you are in Kumasi. Crazy part. Then there's some part of New York. It is like heaven. <laughs> he could have come to stay in those places in the 21st century, but he came according to the fullness of time that the Father has said, you are on this earth at this time. John Wesley has come. He's gone. If the Lord tarries, we may be gone. But what are we leaving behind? May we come out of this comfort zone because nothing will be born for God in comfort. And like I said yesterday, I am not ready. It's not a mindset of God. I am not ready. It's not something God wants. What he wants is I'm ready to obey. He wants you to obey, not I am ready. Just obey and move. He will do the rest of the work through you. Are we alive today? So it's very important that we recognize this very important fact. So the question you need to ask yourself in a short time before I move to another topic, why plant daughter churches? That will be the next one. Is what are your reasons for planting churches? I've asked the question before and I now want to now reflect. I have taught you five things. There's a next question on the slide. Please move to that. What are your reasons for planting churches? And what are your greatest hopes and dreams in planting a church? Take note of these questions. Reflect on them because we'll have a session that I will ask you these questions. But I want us to practically start thinking about the fact that we can be used by God to be part of a church planting movement. The church will not grow unless we plant churches. I mean, we have several examples of that, isn't it? Even when we go to camp, we see that we have come from the different church plants on the various campuses, and it's a whole thing altogether when we come and realize, look at the number. Some people that will never be reached can be reached when we plant churches. And God is counting on you in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. What are some of your greatest concerns when it comes to planting churches? What are some of your great? Because when we don't have answers to this, we will know, but we won't do. And then we will be suffering from Jonah's disease. He knows God. He knows what God has said. He knows everything, but he doesn't have the same heartbeat of God for lost souls. He was more concerned about a plant than 120,000 people who are in spiritual darkness. It tells you where our priorities are. Be alive this morning. And whatever your concerns are, they are not anything that can be dealt with. Paul had dealt with it. Peter had dealt with it. All the apostles dealt with it. The early missionaries dealt with it. Some of us, we have dealt with it. Amen. And the final question is something that you answer to me at the end of today's training. What do you think you need most out of your time here at doing the Master's Will 23? So again, just to recap, don't forget the principles that apply when it comes to why we must plant churches. The mission principle and the multiplication principle. At least if you forget anything at all, they all start with an M. Mission principle, multiplication principle. Amen. The central work of the new church, the central work of every church 
But for the fact that we are planting churches, the central work of the new church will always be to help people put their trust in Christ. That should be the main thing that we are teaching. That's why when we are starting churches, at least we, you are blessed to be in a church where the foundation is laid. Just preach only from my book, Doing the Master's Will. Just let it be the title of your messages. Every page. In fact, you can preach 10,000 messages from that book. And I can tell you that because we started churches asking the one leading the church, just preach only from here. And you see the results. Because some kind of things are being preached around. This is the raw message. This is what people are looking for. There are a lot of people that are feeling thousands of check buildings and they cannot explain what it means to be born again. If you start preaching this, exactly what the problem was from Genesis, etc., somebody's going to say, I never heard it this way. And that's what is going to establish somebody. That's what a lot of people are looking for to hear. And when we teach such teachings, because it is really the raw word of God, the spirit of God will watch over that word and confirm it with signs and wonders. So you already have the material prepared. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus. So that should always be the focus. And grow into maturity as followers of Christ. That should be the focus. We are growing people. The church is a place where we rear Christians. And the multiplication principle is that healthy churches will reproduce. Healthy churches will reproduce. When the church is not reproducing, we have to ask, is it healthy? Churches that are healthy will reproduce and daughter churches or daughter church planting should be envisioned and planned from the new church's beginning. From day one, you focus there that we are not going to remain only this branch. We are going to go out. We are going to look for opportunities. We are going to the next town. And we're going to get it done. And you're going to get involved whenever anything like that. Because that is how anointings are released. When you are, anytime you are part of a church planting movement, God knows there will be inadequacy there. He releases a certain level of power upon the people who are planting the church and they move. And as they start, you begin to hear testimonies from that place and you wonder what's going on there. How about this guy, when he was in HQ, he wasn't in anything. Yes, you have to move. Brother Philip was in HQ. In Acts chapter 8, Brother Philip, he was in HQ. He was not a pastor. He was not an apostle. He was an active member of the church. And then he found himself in Samaria. And then the Bible says, evil spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many. When the guy was in HQ, he didn't even have a chance to lay hands on anybody. When a chief witch doctor came into confrontation with him, the chief witch himself realized the Bible says seeing and hearing the miracles. He could not but to commit himself to follow. And the whole city gave their life to Christ. And there was great joy in that city. And Apostle Peter was not there. John was not there. James was not there. Bartholomew was not there. Ordinary Philip with Holy Ghost. Because once you take the step, as I told you yesterday, don't say, I'm not ready. Hey, I don't know. Hey, I'm not sure. I'm not confident. Just obey. The thing is obedience. Move. From the planting of this church, from its early beginnings, even from the Holy Ghost Center time, five years, and then the full church from 1998, I was not ready in any of them. But I was just obedient. By the time I started, I haven't gone to Bible school. So I was like, oh, I, didn't, I don't have Bible school training. Uh, I need to wait. No, I just obeyed. And the rest followed. That's how it works. God needs your obedience than anything. And obedience is always the challenge. 
Because we look around and say, ah, but if I do this, and what have that, what have, what have about this, and how, oh, but how am I going to leave this one, and how am I going to do this? Just obey. God has been waiting for millions to be saved. How ready are you? Our season will pass. And what would you have said you did for God with all the opportunities he gave you? Amen. Hallelujah. So I want you to take a few minutes to think about what I've just shared. And then I'll take you on to the next lesson on why we have to plant daughter churches. As you think about it, I want you to prayerfully consider what you have just heard. Prayerfully. Start committing it to God and say, Lord, help me. Help me to be able to do this. Sometimes it may start with a cell meeting, with a community house fellowship, a CHF. In that place, in that city, in that town. God is counting on us. We have heard too much. We have received too much. Otherwise, we are becoming like Jonah. We have the head knowledge, but we don't have the heart beat of God. Hallelujah. Somebody pray in the next few minutes. Just talk to God. I, see, each of these, as I presented, the Spirit of God will just take absolute control over you and will begin to minister to you in a unique way. Hallelujah. Somebody pray. Kados. Somebody pray that all that you have learned, all you have said this morning, let it fire a fresh wave of revival in your spirit. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, I pray. That this morning, let there be another wave of understanding as we approach this second level of teaching. Let there be revelation and insight. And as your word comes through this teaching, let there be fire in our hearts. Let there be fire in our bones. Let there be desire to do this. In the name of the Lord Jesus, raise missionaries, Lord, raise missionaries. Raise missionaries in the name of Jesus. Let this be prophetic, Lord. And let this be apostolic in the name of Jesus. Amen. Put your hands together for the Lord Jesus. I want to move on to the next thing I want to teach you on why plant a daughter church. We have looked at why plant churches. We are, now look at, we are now going to look at why do we have to plant a daughter church? Why plant a daughter church? So in this session, we'll be looking at the principles that apply. That is the multiplication principle. We want to talk about why we need to plant daughter churches and the application of the multiplication principle. So the multiplication principle teaches us that healthy churches will reproduce and daughter church planting should be envisioned and planned from the new church's beginning. So right from the beginning of this church, called Christ Church International, it has undergone various metamorphoses from Holy Ghost Center to Christ Chapel International to Christ Chapel Ministries to Christ Church International. Right from day one, I've always envisioned that that church is not going to remain one church. It's going to multiply. So it's always something I have encouraged. Everywhere I find myself, I'm looking for opportunity. How do we plant a church here? See, if you want to be church planting conscious, wherever, whatever you are doing, whatever opportunity you get, you ask to ask yourself, how do we fit this into a church planting move?
Recently, my youngest brother in the United States, he's a pastor of the Church of Pentecost in the United States. He came to stay with me for five days after he has been sent on a mission to um, Rwanda. And in July past, the last week of July, Church of Pentecost across the world, all their branch pastors and deacons were all asked to assembly, to assemble in Rwanda. They have never had a church there. They are going to start a church. Over a thousand of them hit the streets. And by the time they finished, they had raised 400 new souls and about to start a new church in the city. That's how they spread. The next strategy they have adopted, which is the same as what winners have been adopting, is the fact that, for example, if we want to start a church, they want to start a church, let's say, in Ghana or Malawi or South Africa or Scotland, about 10 or 20 committed stewards and leaders will avail themselves, take time off work, and decide that they, if their work enables them to work remotely, as the situation has become, they all relocate to go and start the new church. They all go. 50 of them straight to Scotland. Go and stay there. They have a plan for six months. And when they all go to stay there for six months, they are still working. Some may have taken maybe sabbatical, depending on the level of their position in their workplaces. But they have taken that and gone. And as they do so, because they are already established leaders, when they do that major outreach, everybody goes to help them anyway to do that outreach just like I described with 1,000 people on the ground or 500 people or 50 people. Once they've done that, you see new people that come in and they said the church is taking off on Sunday. The church that is taking off on Sunday doesn't look like an amateur church. So it means that people in the community who come in there feel like staying because this is not like try and error. Because when they come, they realize that the people that are there, they are leaders already, as if this church has been existing here for a long time, but they don't know that the people travel from somewhere and came. Because one to teach children's service is already there. So somebody's bringing children, we have got someone to teach children's service. It's not like, please, can you teach children's service? No, they've got that already. They pull them from headquarters or from another branch. And these are committed people and they go for this. But once they are there and now people are coming into the church, the one leading praise is already established. Everything. People feel like belonging to such places. And whilst that is on the ground, new people that came in, they start quickly training them into leadership, etc. And by the time two months is here, Brother John and his wife, because they come like families, Brother John and his wife who came suddenly have to go back to Nigeria. See, they, are, they started withdrawing gradually. Within a space of one year, all that came earlier have withdrawn and new leaders from that same location has been raised in their place. Are you get, getting the concept? And gradually, it establishes and it grows. So, because the moment you become missionary-minded, such ideas, creativity, and concepts begin to drop in your spirit. So, there is nowhere we cannot reach we just have to have men and women who don't only have the knowledge of God in their head, but the heartbeat of God. So I asked my brother, so did they pay for your flight? He said, no, you take care of it yourself. You'll be rewarded later on, but you take care of it yourself. <laughs> he said, so you went to Rwanda for this? How many days? He said, 15 days. Was it 10 days they were? They are about... Some 10, 10 days, I think 10 days. They ate with the natives. They did massive evangelism. There is no church of Pentecost in that country. They started it from base by releasing all leaders on the ground. And by the time, at the end of 10 days, they have 400 to start the church with. And they are calling it Kigali City Church from the capital. Church we can do that. And we can do greater. In the name of Jesus. Mission conscious. So that if we spread that way, 
Like I'm saying, if we adopt the principle of even 10 member, 10 member, 10 member, and you have 200 churches made up of 10, 10 people, we have a 2,000 member congregation. You have reached 2,000 people for the Lord. And these are the principles Jesus himself developed as well. He started with the 12, then 70 others also. Then gradually, pockets of that being planted here and there, here and there, before you realize it's taking off. So the multiplication principle is a very important thing to plant daughter churches. So there are three things that are important. You know, many times our main focus goes on the salary, the people, the money, in church, where are we going to get the money from? The people, the ground, etc. We need to remove all of these things. Just let's obey and take off first. Why do we say mother or daughter church terminology? Why do we say so? In the scriptures, the church is always female. When Jesus gave us the parable of the foolish virgins, he talked about the bridegroom. He is that bridegroom. Paul, in teaching about marriage, told us that when he's teaching marriage, he's teaching the mystery that exists between Christ and his church. And he talks about Christ being the groom. He's gone away. He's coming for his bride. The church is the bride. So every time in scriptures, the church is spoken of in the context of a female. Amen. What is mother church and what is the daughter church? Christ is the groom and the church is the bride. One day the groom will come for his bride and we will have the marriage supper of the lamb. Revelations 22. Revelations 20, 21, 22. So it's very clear that the church, if the church is female, that's why we have what we call sister churches, not brother churches. <laughs> and when a church starts another church, it is the mother church. So, so far, this is the mother church. And when we have started another church, that becomes the daughter church. Then when the daughter church gives birth to another church, we become grandmother church. <laughs> Hallelujah. And this is consistent with biblical symbolism. And he extends the metaphor of Christ being the groom and the church being the bride. Are we okay with this preparation? All right. So the biblical foundations for doctrine. The Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus commands us. Every time you read that, see it as command. It was not a suggestion. It's not passive. It's a very active, strong command. I wish you were in the room when it says go. You would have heard it. I pray that you hear it that way. Go. There's an agency here. I finished my part. You have to do yours. Go. This is the Christian. The Christian who goes is the Christian who pleases God. Teach them to obey everything. When we have a church, it becomes the foundation, the ground, the template, the platform by which we are able to teach these new believers all that Christ has commanded us. So a church is a weekly gathering or a daily gathering of people who have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and who are being taught all that Christ has commanded us. That's the church. So the Great Commission because you see most born again believers are aware of this mandate go and preach the gospel. However, not all believers have thought strategically about how this great commission should be fulfilled. 
Some of the examples what I gave you about how we can spread ourselves to locations and plant churches there. And so if we are going to take Jesus' commission seriously, we must ask, what is the biblical pattern for fulfilling it? And the answer, as we have seen, is that the leaders in the early church obeyed Christ by planting new congregations. They planted new congregations. We have also looked at the fact that churches dotted other churches in biblical times. Dotted. It's a nice term. Either intentionally or unintentionally. See, intentionally we plan to do it there. There's also sometimes an unintentional thing. We hit something and we met somebody and as we begin to speak, it became necessary we must plant the church here. So planting and doctrine churches is very, very important. The great commission is there. Then the great promise is also one biblical foundation for daughtering. The great promise. You know the great promise? Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. He says he will build his church. Would you not play a role as he builds his church? As we go to preach the gospel, we are helping him to build his church. He's partnering with us to build his church. And then, the parable of the lost sheep is another biblical foundation for doctrine. So that we can understand that it is already in the Bible why we must do this. Daughter churches. Daughter churches. He says, I will build my church. He didn't say, I will build a radio ministry. Or a Christian camp. A hospital. Bible society. He says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And when he says the gates of hell, you see, gates are not offensive. They are defensive devices. If we're going to go out, that's why he calls us to go out. We must go and plunder the gates of hell so that sinners that are being kept behind it, we pull them out. When he says I will build my church, he wasn't thinking fortress mentality that we stay inside and barricade ourselves inside, but we have to go out and plunder. The devil won't move until we come out. He's happy if we are just inside and we are not touching anybody on the streets. He had them already. That's why persecution begins when you start churches. That's why persecution begins when you start reaching out to people. When the ministry begins to make impact, the devil will raise people to attack it. When you are getting no attacks, you have not shaken the gates of hell. You are not looking like the church because the gates of hell must attack because he didn't say the gates of hell will not attack. He says the gates of hell will not prevail. That means that they will come and attack, but they will not prevail. So if you are getting no attacks, you are mince meat for the devil. He comes to your chair to sit down, cross his legs and just relax. Nothing shakes him. Your church is too cool for him. So the biblical strategy is to attack the gates of hell. Not with shotguns and fire hoses. It is with planting churches that shakes the gates of hell. Because planting churches is like coming to take a territory and establish a diplomatic mission. Say so we are staying here. And now we have a mission. We are going to reach out to all the people here. That's what the devil doesn't like. If we are able to plant a church in any place, you have seized a geographical territory. Because everybody in any place, they are being controlled by the powers of darkness in the place until a true church arrives in the place. 
So our spiritual weapon and our spiritual warfare should not just be limited to the prayer room. After we have done the battle in the prayer room, we must take it to the gates and plant a church there. That is a statement to the enemy. That we didn't come to take sides. We have come to take over. Tell somebody, we didn't come to take sides. We have come to take over. Hallelujah. That's a great promise. And then, the parable of the lost sheep. Luke 15, 1 to 7. Jesus told us, the whole of Luke chapter 15 is about this, but we want to take only the first 1 to 7, where he talked about the lost sheep. He says that there was a certain shepherd. He had 99 sheep with him. One got lost. And the Bible says, we're looking at verse 1 to 7. It's the verse 7, which is the conclusion. But the Bible says, he left the 99 behind. It's very easily went looking for the one that is missing. It's very easy when you have a lot of people to say, it's okay. I'm fine with this. Listen, anybody God called to found a church or to lead a church, he didn't tell you, I have only called you to pastor 100. No, he said, all the world, all the world, all the people in the world, they are your constituency. You are to reach them. All the people in the world, they are your parish. If you look at the concept of even the Church of England and Catholic churches, you see, that's why they have a parish priest. Once you are a parish, the whole people in the community, they, they are under your... So whether they come to church or not, that's why when some of them are going to get married, they easily come to the place, I want to get married. So long as I'm living within your catchment area, because that is how they established the churches. The bishops were ordained with a diocese in mind, a geographical jurisdiction is under their control. They understand it, that's how they all work. Recently, an archbishop came into London. When he was coming all the way, as soon as he hit Kent, he gave me a call. He said, sir, I'm within your jurisdiction. I want to report myself. Let the heavens be safe for me. He understands it. He's not a charismatic preacher. He understands it. He understands. His Church of England, he understands. That you are the Pentecostal bishop for Kent. He said, I know you know something we too we don't practice. We may have structure, but you have the spirit and fire. Church, let's wake up. In Jesus' name. Jesus said, he left everything and paid the price for that one person. Can we go all out for that one person? There may be 120 people, 120,000 people who don't know their left and right from anything concerning righteousness. But we have the truth. May we go out there boldly. Listen, you can take that territory for God. After we have fasted and prayed, let's step out to the next town. Do something there. It will grow. It will grow. Gradually it will grow. And when he had brought that person back to the fold, that sheep back to the fold, the Bible says he called for everybody. He said, come and rejoice with me. This, my sheep, was lost. But I have now found it. If you look at the next parable, it talks about the parable of the lost coin. And after all this, then he concluded to that scripture that we were going to read. He says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who don't need repentance. I don't know whether this scripture speaks to you, but I pray that you will get it from the way Christ communicated it and how the apostles received it. This should cut your heart. He says, there will be more rejoicing in heaven. I have realized in the scriptures, nowhere in the Bible were we told that celestial cherubims and seraphims rejoiced unless it is rigged connected to the salvation of a soul. We have never been told that angels went on a procession, a victory procession, and jumping, hey, hallelujah. The Bible says they only do that when we win one soul. Angels go on a victory celebration when we win one. Jesus, the son of God, who has been to heaven and was on earth and is gone back to heaven, says, I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner 
Who repents? Than 99 righteous persons who don't need to repent. So if we stick to church and everybody is born again, according to the Bible, there will be no rejoicing in heaven. Can we make angels happy? Can you make it your mission to let there be consistent celebration in heaven? I believe when that is the case, even when God has not yet prepared to answer something and has prepared that next year is going to answer something, I believe that an angel will go to him, Father, won't you send me to Cynthia? She's just making us very happy. I mean, I just want to go and carry this blessing to her. I've been eavesdropping the prayers she has been praying to you. You said, I've seen that your timetable says next year, September, but can we do it December before December 31st? Father, send me. We want to go. We want to go and hand over the breakthrough to her. You are making angels happy. There is no record in scripture that angels rejoice except on this occasion. And the one telling us that we must believe in him. Amen. It is very easy to rationalize away the planting of new churches with excuses like, oh, we are too small at the moment. Well, it will cost too much. Oh, we tried it before and it failed. Try it again. Because you see, when we compare the negatives of the price that Christ paid, the excuses will melt away. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.25, he loved the church and gave himself up for it. Do you love the church? The evidence of your love for the church is that you give yourself up for the church. Where is your time? Where is your availability? Where is your commitment? Every excuse will melt away. It will melt away. When we consider what he has done for us, When you say we are too small, the early church, they were also too small. Paul was just planting churches. Check how the church in Philippi was planted as they got to Macedonia to plant that church. Only he and his team and the first person they got into the, the person's house was Lydia and they started it from that house. They started it, check it. Acts 16, Acts 17, that's where it started. Today we write it, he writes to the church in the Philippians. It started with somebody's house, the church in that house. You are not too small. Jesus compared the kingdom to a master seed. Plant it, gather. When we have two, three people, we are taking off. In the name of Jesus. I will share the strategy with with leaders when we have our general council meeting. How many people gather and that is church? And how many of those churches become a district? How many of those districts become an area? How many of those areas become a region? How many of those regions become a nation? Church, we are serious. Our master paid the price. We, human life was so important. The salvation of the soul was so important. He left heaven. The glories of heaven. Golden street. Angels worshipping every day. Powerful atmosphere. And he came to live in dusty Israel. With some illiterate fishermen. Some of whom can rebuke him. When he actually made them. <laughs> Just so that he can pay the price. Can we come out of our comfort zones? In the name of Jesus. Everything is possible when you put your mind to it. When everywhere you are, listen, we can create it except that we are not willing. If we are willing, we can create it. Because you see, you and I may be the last outpost on the road to hell. You and I may be the last outpost on the road to hell for somebody. Somebody's on the road to hell. 
They are passed by many, many places. They are just close. You may be the last barrier. But then we have got, oh, look, I think we are not ready yet. We are not ready yet. People, may we appear before this king of glory that no other person's blood can be found in our hands that we failed to communicate because we are looking for perfect conditions before we carry on the next work. I didn't look for perfect conditions when I was starting the church in London. I didn't. As I shared last night, there were so many things for which I could have given nice excuse and keep waiting. Just obey take off. Be part of a movement like that. We will see God's goodness and the salvation of many. Don't think you are too little and you are too small and we are too few and it's only me. How is this going to work? You see, to the world, you may be one person, but to another person, you may be the world. To the world, you may be one person. Even to yourself, you may be one person. But to another person, you are their whole world. Some of the things you know in this church, somebody is just waiting to hear. That's why when some of you speak at some places, they ask whether you are a pastor and you are just an ordinary member of the church. Because we have fed you so much here. But you don't realize that you are somebody's world. You are a lifesaver for a whole community, a whole street. Some people are waiting for you. Let's move on quickly to practical reasons for daughtering. Practical reasons. Reason A, effectiveness in evangelism. We saw it in some form earlier on. Reasons for planting daughter churches is that it is the effective way of evangelism. The effective way of evangelism. Church planting is the most effective evangelistic strategy based on church growth research. It's not only that I'm telling you, it has been researched. When we find it in the scriptures, you see it also clear the same way. From Judea to... Don't want us where Jesus said it. When he gave the command, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we like quoting it. Look at the sequence. He said, I'm not, I don't want you to only be in Jerusalem. Another one should be planted in Judea. Samaria. To the uttermost parts of the world. Because new churches simply reach lost people more effectively than any other strategy that can be used. People who are lost, they are in different parts of the country. We have to go there and plant church. You know, sometimes people may love our ministry online, but we have to go on the ground. Because you can't disciple people online. How do you raise a choir online? Ushers online. Various ministry groups online. So, people can connect with your ministry online, but you have to go on the ground. Before we went to the ground in Switzerland, people in Switzerland were watching me on TV. If we are, about, if we are serious about fulfilling the Great Commission, we must be serious about planting new churches, daughtering churches. We must focus our time, our energy, and our money in what works. Because the fact is that the most effective method of evangelism is church planting and the most effective method of church planting is daughter church planting. Amen. Effective method of evangelism is we plant a church. Effective method of church planting is that the church that has been planted will also plant another church. And the reason why this is the effective 
way of doing it is because of conception. 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 What does conception mean? See, it is possible nowadays to conceive a child in a petri dish. You know, you can have all kinds of procedures these days. Have a child outside the womb and bring it back into the womb. In vitro fertilization, IVF, etc. But it is not the natural way of conceiving a child, isn't it? There's a, a standard natural way. This is now a scientific improvement of what God made and say we can still have something like that in the event that the people or the couple are struggling medically, then this can be done. Are you here? So this is in no way to discredit that. I'm just taking you that it, it, the natural way is there's a natural way. So many times people can conceive a child, but it is not only the conceiving of the child. It is the ability to actually take care of the child. So in the same way, it should be the church that gives birth to a church. It shouldn't be another group or organization that gives birth to the church. The church must be given birth to by the church. So Christians should beget Christians. And churches should beget churches. Amen. As I just spoke King James English. Because when churches produce churches, we have more churches. The DNA remains the same. It is able to weave through. It's able to take care of it. It's able to nurture it. It's able to provide every nourishment that it needs. Because if you truly give birth to something, you will care for it. Unless there's something wrong with the way you process information. I don't want to use another term. One of the great Christian writers of old made a very profound statement. He said, hardly anything demonstrates the health of a congregation as much as the willingness and ability to give birth to new congregations. Give me that screen. So at least somebody can take a photo of that. Hardly anything demonstrates the health of a congregation as much as the willingness and ability to give birth to new congregations. And the opposite is true as well. Hardly anything is more clear indication of illness than structures which by design hinder church multiplication or at best permit it as an absolute exception. And this is a philosophical statement. What he's saying is that the clearest sign that a church is healthy is its ability to plant churches. The clearest sign that a church is ill are structures in place that hinder church growth and church planting. Do we have anything in place that hinder church planting? Then let's knock it down. Let's release the ground. I'm determined that at the end of this conference, we will have disciple makers and church planters. As I'm standing here, this is the third time I've seen this come up as an open vision, the word apostle. And God will be raising apostolic people from this place at the end of this conference. A fresh heart and a fresh mission. In the name of Jesus, open up the territories where you live. Let's start a movement of community house fellowships that will become churches. Churches that will start outright. Every group and everyone can be gathered in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So conception, conceiving something, we giving birth to the thing is a key element of the process. 
The next thing is that we said effectiveness in evangelism and the reason is because the church gave birth to a church. It becomes effective. The next thing is nurturing. Nurturing. Because when you give birth to something, you will nurture it. Like human babies, baby churches need a mother because of the nurturing that must come from that mother. So imagine a newborn child that doesn't have a mother. What do you do with a child like that? What I mean, in case somebody must adopt the child, somebody must provide something for the big, otherwise the child will not survive. So when the church gives birth to churches, it provides nourishment, it provides support. You know, if a mother abandons her child, she's arrested and prosecuted. So when a, ch a church gives birth to a church, it cannot abandon it. That's why it's important, and it's also a sign that it's an effective way of evangelism and spreading the gospel. Whenever a church gives birth to a church, the advantage is that there is already a base by which the new church receives nourishment in the form of counseling, in the form of mentorship, in the form of direction, in the form of encouragement. Experience comes in. Something may be going on. When the senior pastor gets there, he's able to just give one, two words and something changes. So mentorship is provided. Wise counsel and strategic decisions. Discipline when needed. Because sometimes you have to discipline somebody. Discipline should not be seen as an attack. It is a way by which you are straightened to get it right. And the third reason why it is an effective way or effectiveness in evangelism, makes evangelism effective, is that of resources. Resources become available as well. Because as the church gives birth to a church is able to provide. The mother church has some resources that is able to provide to the daughter church. Sometimes some of our branches need something and then we have to support and provide. Provide an equipment. Provide something. So there are resources and there are different kinds of resources. Leaders and workers can be released to go and support. Facilities. Sometimes the experience of the mother church is able to say, no, in this territory, get this planning permission, get this and get this type of building. So it's always very important that such resources come in. Finances. Sometimes the startup may not be that good, but we have started. One way or the other, something can go in to help pay for the rent of the place at a temporary time for temporary measures and gradually until the church finds its feet. Amen. The church then finds its feet and is able to take care of things. Oversight in terms of spiritual oversight. These are all resources. I said earlier on site selection assistance. Sometimes there's an eye that the senior pastor has that you may not have. So he comes to the ground and says, no, not this way. This place, this is here. This one, if we get it in this place, it will help. Training is part of the resources. Provide training. Whenever I go on apostolic visits, at least there's a day set aside for training. We provide different levels of training. Sometimes HQ helps in supporting a branch with their new life school class. So they connect online and someone is sitting at HU and teaching. That is providing that help as well. Helping to promote. Maybe we may have some resources here. Maybe for example the media team has got teams now that can design flyers, etc. This can be done for some of the courts. I mean currently in Accra they want to start the Protons Church at Accra Technical University. All their flyer was designed at Canterbury by the media department in Protons. And they just send it over and they just carry it through. So that is resource. So there's already a base. We are blessed to have a base already. Amen. So God wants to save the lost 
And the best way to do that is through church planting. And the best way to plant is to have churches give birth to churches. Amen. Another practical reason for daughtering is increased spiritual passion in the mother. Increased spiritual passion in the mother. You see, wonderful things happen in the church when it becomes a mother church. Number one, an increased passion for the Great Commission takes place. What do I mean by this? It comes from making a practical application of the most effective evangelistic strategy because the mother church has done that. We have gone to plant a church now. And there's that great passion for the Great Commission because you have seen that it has worked. You planted a church and you are looking at the results and it fires another one in you that feels like, let me have another one. Every mother that has gone to the labor world and had a child, it comes out with pain. And at one point in time, they feel like, I don't want to have another one. But after some time, you ask them the same question. You say, hey, I want another one. This one cannot be playing alone. It needs another one. And another one will come. So it fires a, an increased passion. Because once we see, oh, we planted it at Ellsbury. We planted it at Canterbury. We planted it here. You know, you feel like we want to do more. It fires that zeal. And it also comes from watching, that passion comes from watching the daughter reach people and thinking about the potential. So you realize that the daughter church is reaching a certain group of people that you couldn't reach yourself, but they are reaching it. And that makes you feel like, come on, then I'm going south. And we go north. And we're going west. We're going east. We're going all over the place. So when we say the spiritual passion in the mother, that is what I'm talking about. An increased passion for the Great Commission. Secondly, God blesses those who give. The reason why the spiritual passion is increased is that God begins to bless those who gave. Some people gave money. Some people decided, Pastor, because of what you have said, I'm going to relocate to the north for this period. I'm going to be part of this group. I'm going to be part of this group that is going here. And as they pay the price to go, God has always rewarded them. So when you tithe your finances, you tithe your church membership too. You tithe your availability for the service, for being part of a missionary team, for being part of a new church startup somewhere. Amen. So the rewards are often financial and they are also often spiritual. I don't know how he will choose to bless, but I know that God always blesses when people are involved in spreading the gospel that way. The third practical reason under the increased spiritual passion in the mother is that it leads to climbing spiritual mountain which results in a deepened relationship with God. Because you see, when you do something that you didn't think was going to happen, as you planted a church and it's like it's growing, suddenly it changes your relationship with God. You begin to understand God in a new way. And because you have taken such a spiritual climb, you begin to experience God at a level that you have never imagined. Because some of the people that have gone there, you are seeing the mighty acts of God in them and you wonder, what's going on here? It makes you begin to see God in the way you have never seen him. The fourth one there on new strategies for outreach are often discovered through planting a daughter church. Remember the main thing there is increased spiritual passion in the mother. 
And we are seeing that one of the reasons why that happens is that because when we plant new churches, you will see that new strategies for our outreach are often discovered when we plant new churches. There are some things that we are doing because we started the church in Canterbury. The Protons Church in Canterbury. There are certain things that has come along from there as a result of the church plant and some of the means by which discipleship is taking place and people are being followed up. The follow-up strategy, the accountability group thing, all of that, all of those things have been taken to another level. I taught accountability group to them when we are taking off in terms of the core protons that started, but then it has been taken to another level, deeper level from what I thought, and I felt it's an effective way. God has his way of actually picking what you shared and amplifying it in a much better way. So the effective follow-up in that system is so strange and amazing, and it's something that everyone must adopt to follow at a higher level. We don't lose the souls easily. We don't lose the souls easily. Because of that accountability group thing. Amen. So different ideas for evangelism comes along because we planted the church in different locations. You learn from all those other places and realize that it works effectively in Swiss this way. It works here that way. It works here that way. You put all together and it gives the main church further ideas on how to expand. So new things come along when we plant churches. Daughters has ideas for evangelism that mother learns from. You catch enthusiasm for evangelism through daughter. It moves evangelism to a higher level in the mother. And God blesses the mother's sacrifice with fruit. Amen. I remember last year when we finished the, the Saturday. New, um, the, doing the master's will last year. Version. And we finished on Saturday. You know, I've gone back to the house and I realized, ah. I was seeing Instagram stories. And then I realized that, no, the protons haven't gone home. 8 p.m., they're on the streets in Canterbury preaching the gospel. And it's like they've carried some fire from the conference and they are hitting the streets with it. And it's amazing. When you plant churches, it comes with new ways of doing things which are also positive. Amen. And then the third bit there, when I finish this session, then we'll take a break and then we'll come back and continue. C, take us to C. Parenting is a joyful experience. That's the third reason why, their practical reason for daughtering. Why should we have daughter churches? Inez. We must plant a church in Cambridge. Amen. Parenting is a joyful experience. Having children is one of the most wonderful experiences of life. Ask people what is most important to them and they will usually respond it is their family, their spouse, their children and grandchildren. If you work in the medical field and you are by the side of anyone dying, you realize most of their last words, please, if my wife comes and I didn't survive, tell her I love her and tell her I say she take care of the children. I've heard it time and time and time again. A woman dying and say the same things, my children. Tell them I love them. When you give birth, there's a joyous thing. Does it involve any sacrifice? Yes. But is it worth it? Yes. So when we give birth to daughter churches, it will come with sacrifice, but it is worth it. There are some people we will never be able to minister to them until we plant a church. Amen. Again, if I use Switzerland as an example, there are people I've gone to meet there. And I wonder how would I have preached to such people since I don't speak French and German. But because the church was planted, it is an effective way by which they have been reached. 
Last Saturday, I have to bless the first marriage in the church in Zurich. And I had to preach in English and it's translated in French. And then on Sunday when I'm speaking, it's translated in German. Now, me, I say vous ici is what I know. <laughs> How would I have reached such people if we didn't plant a church there? But they are very lovely people, people whose lives have been transformed because the church went in that direction. And that is all that I'm talking about. Hallelujah. Amen. And there's another effort from there for, have, for us to have a branch in France. I was like, man, where in France? Are they in Paris? Paris. So we are not joking. Amen. And you too, you can do something. In Jesus' name. So it comes at a price. It will come at a cost. If time permits, I'll teach you church planting landmines. So the more you work on it, the more rewarding it is. Amen. And then the final thing there is leadership development. Oh, it's not the final thing. Leadership development. When we plant church, that's the D. The practical reason for daughtering, a daughter church, is that it leads to leadership development. It helps develop leadership. I cited the example about Philip. When he went to Samaria, it was a different thing. When he was in HQ, he wasn't leader. But when he went, the grace of God makes that possible. But then the mother church knows that if we go with three people to that place, we will need someone to handle choir. We will need someone to be trained to handle protocol. We have to train people to teach people, to disciple people. All the various ministries and departments, one person may be handling three of them until we grow more people. So it leads to development of leadership. And not only in the new church, but the gap that has been left by those who left HQ, we have to fill that gap. So some who say me, I'm common floor member, we now cut them and say, you will not be common floor, you will be active floor member. So we now begin to train more people. So the more people are sent, the more we raise from inside. To fill the gap within. So you realize that when we do daughter church planting, it gives the room for leadership development at the place and leadership development down here. I mean, if you look at the CHFs, you see the same thing. We are having everything replicated. Some people can do some things when they were in HQ, they, they don't do. Where is Mal Malika? Where is Mal Yeah. So she sometimes lead worship at CHF, North London CHF. Yeah, doesn't she? And then, uh, who else has been doing the, um, Naomi has been doing the activity. Yeah. But these people, I mean, they just joined the church less than a year ago, isn't it? If they were in the HQ, then they have to go through some process. But once something has started, they must find something to do and skills and development starts taking place. And so eventually, the whole church ends up having trained different levels of leadership. I mean, protons on campuses, you have, some of you, you are preaching there. Chikwadu, you are going to Leicester, where is he? You are preaching there, I'm not there, am I there? Is Abishai there? You will preach. <laughs> <laughs> and you go with your team, you have to preach. Eventually, leadership is being developed, isn't it? So that's exactly what I'm talking about. When we plan churches, it gives the room for development of leadership within the gap that has been created and those who went there, that also makes it possible. And collectively, we end up with crazy leaders, mighty leaders. When we gather, the devil must run. Hallelujah. Glory be to Jesus.
And many people have testified that it has been one of the ways by which they have grown. Because they went away to do something. And they grew. They had the opportunity. Kufo has been leading the revival for the past two. Two Fridays. At the glory night. And when I got the report, I was excited. I think two weeks ago or three weeks ago, she, she, she single-handedly prayed for all those that received the Holy Ghost baptism. Hey, Charlie! <laughs> I appreciate Kofu. I appreciate Kofu. So you see, a pastor doesn't have to be there. Abishai used to be doing that. Now he's, He was in the room, but he didn't touch anyone. He stayed in and allowed Kofu to minister through everybody and they receive Holy Ghost baptism. Authentic tongue speaking. Fire, fire, fire. All over the place. Man. Do we have some of the people here who receive Holy Ghost baptism at that service? Some of them were not here. Zara, where's Zara? <laughs> Hallelujah. But that's what I'm talking about. If she's in headquarters, definitely when that moment comes, it will be pastors who will be called to go and lay hands, isn't it? Even when we call you, say, hey, I don't know. But when we are not there, you see that the gift is working. It makes it possible. That's why I told you, this I am not ready, spirit. We are not ready for it this year. Amen? Amen? Amen. In Jesus' name, leadership development comes. Then kingdom growth. It is easy for us when we are pastoring one branch or one church or HQ to just be focused only so what is important is the priority is where we are now. But when we become church planting focused, the kingdom grows. Amen. Because many times, the moment you have got the people, you've got the finances to take care of things, and you've got the buildings, we just think it's okay. But listen, there are millions that are still not saved. As I've always advised pastors and church workers, anywhere you are, get the data of the total population of the people in the place and know that we can reach all these people. I mean, I'm never satisfied. I mean, London alone, the population is 8 million people. It means no church in London seats 10% of the population of London. I'm yet to see a church that seats 800,000 people in London. 800,000 is 10% of 8 million. So all those people on Sunday, where are they? They are in the next version of what Satan has prepared. Every Sunday, they are in the cathedral at the stadium. It's the new religion. It's the new religion. Come to church. Oh, you guys, you are very noisy. Go to Arsenal. Hey, hey. And the same people are shouting like that. They say, what? You guys have such a voice? That's their religion. Sunday morning religion. They said the match is starting at 3 o'clock. They will be there by 9. Hours before the time. Drinking themselves to crazy. Ready to be singing and chanting and shouting. Over 22 men running over leather. <laughs> Say, come to church on a Sunday. Uh, what time is your service? At 10 a.m. is a little bit too early. <laughs> Let Manchester United be playing. They will get up and go. People hold season tickets. Everywhere their team goes in Europe, they will go. Come to church. 
Oh, church. Church is boring. It has become a religion. May the Lord help us turn it around. In Jesus' name. May the things that kill kingdom not kill our church. So I, I put it there as bodies, backs, and buildings. That is, the bodies are the people. Money is the backs. Buildings. Once we have a building, we've got the people, and we have some money, we think it's okay. We are happy. We have a church. It's okay. It's not okay. Let's reach out for those who are outside. Let's reach out for more. Let's plant more. Let's send more people. It is said that the strength of a church is not in its sitting capacity. It is in its sending capacity. The strength of a church is not in its sitting capacity. It's in its sending capacity. That's the number six practical reason is family legacy. What do I mean? You see, congregations are like life cycles. And please, everybody pay attention to what I'm about to say. It's a very serious thing. Congregations are like life cycles, just like humans. Churches may have long or short lives, but ultimately, depending on how things go, most churches will die if you don't structure it well. So it is better to plant more churches to sustain the legacy that has been laid. You see, the United Kingdom is a good example of what I'm talking about. 100 years ago, it was a great bastion of faith. They sent missionaries to everywhere in the world. That is when it was called a Christian nation. Today, it is no longer anywhere near Christian. See how quickly they wanted to push to change legislation because of the census report that came and said that there's an increased number of people who don't go to church anymore. And some of us had to argue it back through the House of Lords to say, and I wrote an article on that, I wrote one of the papers for that, to say your research was only on Church of England and Catholic churches. Come and see how our type of churches sit. So don't say that people no longer attend church. Go and do it well. Send your journalists on Sunday to go to Pentecostal churches and see hundreds seated. Don't go to empty Anglican churches that are sitting 30, 20, 10. Some, now they have even, so some of them are selling their church buildings. Because in some place, only five old women go to the church on Sunday. You can't go and do this thing and come and say, the whole United Kingdom, people no longer attend church. And that the fastest growing religion is Islam. Because every Friday, they are on the streets, bowing down. When they over shoot the room or they overrun the room. They, some come outside on the pavement and get police to stand there. So it's like, ah, this is fastest growing. Come to our type of churches and see that we are also sitting hundreds and thousands. So you can't push that thing. But it was amazing that the secular community were ready to say, therefore now remove all the bishops from the house of lords. Now, church, the king cannot be coronated in a cathedral anymore. Can you get rid of the cathedrals and all that? Because we now have evidence. You see, this is what the enemy has been waiting for. If we sit down and do nothing, they will take advantage of some kind of census and begin to control even the gathering of churches. Let's wake up. In Jesus' name. So, the UK used to be like that, but today this is what has happened. Another example is the region of modern Turkey. When I'm talking about death to churches. Turkey. Most of the miraculous church planting recounted in the book of Acts took place in Turkey. Antioch. How many knows Antioch? If you have been, those of you that go on holiday in Turkey, Antakya, that is a place. 
When the Christian Achu died, the earthquake took place there. The only church that has been there for many is the one that Paul was in. That also was affected. But the Turkish government was ready to want to sort of conserve it and still gather the fragments. Even though they have become significantly Muslim, they know that it plays a tourist attraction. But majority of the things recorded in the book of Acts and the movements of Paul took place in today's Turkey. That's where it is. And some years ago, thousands of years ago, 90% of that whole region was Christian. That's why when ISIS took over, it was destroying the churches. It was destroying the church buildings because it wants to wipe out the legacy of the Christian faith. Otherwise, their own doesn't have a foundation. And that's why concerning this Hamas-Palestinian uh, Israel thing, if you are a Christian, wake up. And don't work with the misinformation of atheistic professors. Islam is a political religion. It doesn't stop at just getting people. They take territories. And so you have to understand, if they take over Israel, they will wipe out every foundation of the proof of your faith. ISIS demonstrated it. Everywhere they hit, and there's a church building, or any of the ancient evidence of Christianity, they destroy it. The only reason why the Jewish government, for them, they are in Judaism, still waiting for the Messiah to come. We still have a few Jews who believe in Christ. They are called Messianic Jews. But the Israeli government spends millions, if not billions of dollars, to make sure that whatever is recorded in the Bible, those sites are maintained. And architectural, they fund architectural, um, sorry, um, archaeological excavations because they need the Bible to prove that they were here. The Temple Mount in Jerusalem, where you have the Al-Aqsa Mosque, that was the place where Solomon's temple stood. They have come to build a mosque on it. So who was here before? If you come to build a mosque on my church building, that was here before, and my church building is now under your mosque. Whose land was this? That is enough to answer the question. Amen? Now, Turkey, today, it is 99.8 Muslim. What happened to all the churches? If you read revivals of old, even in Pentecostalism, from A.A. A. Allen, F.F. F. Bosworth, all these people, where are their churches now? Some of the great revivals in the 1940s, they sat in tents, hundreds of thousands of people. Today you go to those places and they are not there. A.A. A. Allen's church is not there. This is a miracle man. He prayed for people who, somebody was born and there were no eyelids. Where your eyes will be is as flat like my forehead. This man prays and a mark, rise at the crusade, a mark of God. God, as if the finger of God just made a mark there and an eye opens. Today, where is his church? It's not there. So that is the reason why we must plant more churches. So that in the event of an attack, in the event of persecution, when HQ is not there, there will be another one that is there. So that the legacy continues. At least there is still a church because the church in Jerusalem did not say we want to be the only church. If they had been and they were persecuted, that would be the end. When we plant churches, it also leads to denominational growth. The church grows. We have CCI churches everywhere. It makes it easier for people to connect. Wherever you find yourself, you don't feel lost. That's why we have maintained the names of the ministries as it is. I ensure that whatever we call the choir here shall be the name of the choir at every branch. So that anytime you have to relocate to anywhere, 
And we have denominational growth because the church has spread everywhere. As we plant daughter churches, we grow like that. Anywhere anybody finds themselves, they don't feel lost. As soon as you get there, you know you are in Christ church. And then, finally, foreign language churches. I can't emphasize that enough. I just shared the German, French thing. And we must be able to have different languages, preaching to different people in different nations and different languages. Because not everybody speaks English. There are some places they can't, we have to speak the local language to get them to understand the message better. Amen. We must be able to plant churches in certain places, remote places, where English is not the language. But the local language, but the people can still be saved. So foreign language churches are needed everywhere. Paul was versatile because he speaks Hebrew, he speaks Greek, and he spoke Latin, which was then the language. If you are in the, because the Roman Empire was controlled, everybody had to speak Latin because that is the language of Rome. So Paul spoke three languages. And he could minister to all these three levels. When he says, all in Caesar's household send their greetings. He had ministered to Caesar's household. He was arrested. He was, he was in jail there. But every soldier that came to be on guard duty, he preached to them. And who didn't have preached in Hebrew to them, he spoke Latin to them. One day when he was beaten and a centurion was dragging him, he said, you slap a Roman citizen? The man said, hey, I, I didn't know you are. Me, I spent so much money to buy this citizenship. Paul said, I was born free. When he finds himself among Jews and he's going to be persecuted, he spoke Hebrew, I come from the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of a Hebrew. Then he looked at the congregation and said, ah, the way they are going to punish me, look at the board. He realized, okay, he's among Pharisees and Sadducees. I am a Pharisee! <laughs> Concerning the resurrection, I'm on trial. Then the Bible says there was confusion among the panel. <laughs> may we be versatile with language but when we plant more churches many more language groups are rich for the gospel in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ the son of the living God put your hands together for the Lord Jesus let's pray shortly I wanted to talk to God reflect on what I've just shared and just say Lord help me in the mighty name of Jesus help me Lord Thank you for this understanding. Thank you for this understanding. Thank you for this understanding. Thank you, Kede Masupli Atakaba. Libri Kabra Zabra Kapan Talababa. Yanda Lababa Shiboranda Lababa. Ya Belante Lemaba Sibri Atakalamaba. E la marabaya kapari ande saprato kandole baba. E ramayatari abashupranto katala baba. E ramakapari andala la basabrata kapala baba. E la masibrianta la baba kiprando le baba. Alimirianduri abasoprande ketere bala baba. Direct our hearts, O Lord, into missions. Give us your heart, O Lord. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. May the Lord give you a new heart. In the name of Jesus. That we now understand why we must plant churches. Why we must plant daughter churches. We also understand that we don't want to be like Jonah. He has the head knowledge of God. But he doesn't have the heartbeat of God for lost people. This afternoon may the Holy Spirit draw you closer to this mission. Receive a new heart. And by this teaching, may God give you new understanding. May you now look at people with this mentality. You look at communities, cities, towns, everywhere you find yourself, begin to see possibility that we can do something here for God. In Jesus' name. Amen.